Hello. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you all are. Uh, my name is Layla Hawani. I am a social worker at Legal Services of New Jersey. Um, and I am joined um, by Brigia Kalfrist, um, who is from uh, the East Bay Family Defenders, and Alex Dutton um, from Community Legal Services of Philadelphia. And I'm going to give them a chance to kind of give some background about themselves and um, talk about their experience and what they do um, within their organizations. Our presentation is going to be three parts. Um, uh, the first being the social worker's perspective, uh, the second being the parent advocate perspective, and the last being the attorney's perspective. And kind of just touching on um, how our uh, clients' lives have changed, how they've been impacted, um, mostly you know negatively but some po some positive impacts as well since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic and um, how really um, it's impacted their need to be proactive from a virtual sense um, technological standpoint and whatnot. Um, Alex if you want to go next. <laughs> Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Can't see you, but you can see us. Um, I'm Alex Dutton. I'm a staff attorney at Community Legal Services in Philadelphia in our Family Advocacy Unit, which is our Parent Defense Unit. Um, I'll be touching on how the practice of law and dependency proceedings has changed. Um, and I'll describe my presentation more when it's my turn uh, as a result of COVID-19. So we'll uh, we'll get to that when we get to it, um, but I think there will be a cool sort of thread here between all of the different sort of areas of practice um, and the interdisciplinary nature of all of our offices and our work. So welcome. I, I will say while I, I'm, I'm going to be presenting last, if you have questions, please put them in the actual questions um, folder or, or column as opposed to the chat. Feel free to chat, but as I curate questions, which you free, feel free to to ask as we go along. We'll, we'll definitely take questions as we go, um, but I won't be looking for questions in the chat. So just wanted to flag that for you. Thanks. Brigia? Yes. Yeah. So I am Brigia Colthers. Everyone calls me Bree. I am a parent who successfully navigated the system. And I love speaking about virtual court, how it is for parents, the do's and don't with harmful, helpful. I welcome you guys for any questions. No questions is not normal. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I'm excited. Thank you. Okay, Alex, next slide. All right. So, um, again, my name is Layla. I am a um, supervising social worker at Legal Services of New Jersey. Um, I service our entire office um, for clients who have pending legal issues, but also social work needs. Um, and I would say uh, I started in 2013. In about 2018, um, we started a direct referral program where we started getting referrals directly from the division, um, DCPMP, uh, for clients who needed support. Um, and it's kind of allowed us to take on this comprehensive sort of system where um, clients are assigned to an attorney, a social worker, a parent advocate, um, and are kind of um, assisted from a legal standpoint any, any needs that they might have, um, um, housing and tenancy issues, habitability issues, um, um, domestic violence, um, educational law for um, any parents who are dealing with issues with the education system with their kids. So it's kind of um, been a blessing in that sense. Um, and so I've um, been working with a lot of families that are involved in the child welfare system, both pre-removal, post-removal, um, with the ultimate goal, obviously, if it's post-removal for reunification, pre-removal, if, you know, we can just stabilize the family and just, you know, keep the families together. Um, so some of the things that we're going to discuss moving forward, how the pandemic has impacted clients and how they've needed to adapt 
um, how we've needed to adapt in the way that we approach these cases and how you know we can support our clients and kind of give um, my job is going to be to give a little bit of an overview of what the new normal look like looks like for our clients what the reality is and then go into a little bit of the tips and tricks to navigate the system in light of these changes next slide okay awesome so at Legal Services, we operate from a family first um, systems perspective. And um, like I said, our main priority is keeping families together. Um, however, that, that however we can achieve that. The majority of our child welfare involved families are living in poverty. Uh, the majority of the cases involve allegations of neglect. And our biggest thing is really advocating for our clients and kind of um, advocating for them with the division that poverty is not neglect. Um, and, uh, you know, being low income, being a single parent, um, you know, struggling financially, that doesn't mean that you're a bad parent. And so that's our biggest um, really hurdle. Um, and the prevention of removals equals supportive systems. Next slide. Okay. So who is your client? And I think this might be different um, for some of you. It might be spot on. Um, but the majority of our clients are usually single parents with multiple kids. Um, I would say large chunk of our client base is single black moms. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how it's disproportionate in that sense. Um, uh, they're housing insecure either now or they've been chronically homeless um, and dealing with housing insecurity for many, many years. A lot of our um, clients are living in poverty. They might be um, on unemployment. I, I, we've seen that recently, especially because of the pandemic, a lot of people lost their jobs um, because of that. Uh, or they might be on TANF, which is, um, you know, welfare benefits and, um, very little income, obviously, for um, families that are on the welfare system, um, or they're struggling with a low-wage job and not able to um, make ends meet. You know, here in New Jersey, the biggest thing that our clients are struggling with right now is when you're applying for housing, um, they're, the landlords are expecting you to have three times the amount in rent um, uh, income. Um, in order to rent an apartment. So how do we achieve that? How do we get our clients to be in a housing secure place if they're, that's the expectation of them? Um, and they're at these low wage, low minimum jobs. Um, so that's been a struggle. Um, there might, they themselves, the, our parents, are sometimes children of the welfare system themselves. So they are dealing with um, the after effects of that. You know, a lot of them are dealing with mental health um, symptoms and issues, traumatic, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and they might be the, combating the effects of systemic racism, as I touched on before. Alex, thank you. Um, so the disproportionate involvement and disparate about Black families and people of color by child welfare and other systems is compounded by and heightened exposure to chronic intergenerational trauma due to this structural racism. To define and implement a well-being framework that aims to free children and families from adversity and encourage families to thrive, we must radically reconsider if and how we call the child welfare system into action. And that's, I think, where we come into play. Really standing up to the norms and the expectations that the system places on our clients and really combating that and saying, well, you know, this should not be the expectation. Um, and this is not the norm. And, you know, painting our clients in this positive light because they're viewed um, and they're looked at so negatively. Okay. So um, with regards to the pandemic and how it's impacted our clients um, from a technological standpoint and how that plays a bigger role in what their expectations are, um, from the system. I kind of just touch on that because I think that um, it's very strange to be doing child welfare work right now amidst the pandemic because I feel like we're seeing a lot of leniency and a lot of forgiveness 
for people who are not um, living in poverty, you know, employers who are being flexible, uh, work from home, um, extensions, you know, on a large group of matters. But for our clients, the expectations are the same, if not higher, while while they're they're dealing with this pandemic. So how how is that fair? You know, um, so some of the things that our clients that are de are dealing with that are creating barriers for them to exceed and excel in this virtual era. Um, a lot of our clients have working phones. Or if they have a working phone, they have limited minutes. So I will have clients who will call me at the beginning of the month and I'm communicating with them okay. And then we have deadlines and we have things that we have to accomplish. And then all of a sudden the middle to the end of the month comes and I can't reach them. And that's because they've run out of minutes or they've run out of data. And they can no longer communicate. Um, so that's a barrier. Not having a computer or a laptop for family team meetings, Zoom court. So family team meetings pre-COVID, usually always in person. Court was always in person. Now the expectation is you have to be available virtually. And how do you do that? And I think we've seen that a lot of organizations have really stepped up and, um, you know, offered donations of smartphones or computers. But we have to kind of just step back as advocates and say, well, that's not that's not the entire picture. You know, you could have a computer, but you don't necessarily have Internet connection. How do you connect it to Wi-Fi? Um, we've had to send clients modems just to connect to the Internet. You know, they're not always going to have a hotspot. They're not going to be able to afford to pay for a data plan. Um, so just kind of looking at the bigger picture, it's not just about having the device. Um, how do you make it work? Um, another major challenge is childcare. Uh, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of daycares were closed. Um, a lot of our clients are in um, shelters because they're in between housing, they're in transitional housing. And so the, um, the shelters have certain rules. And, you know, when it comes to your child, you have to be there within, you know, at the shelter with your kids. So you can't just leave and go to your job to try to earn income and hopefully get out of there. You need to be with your kids unless you can have somebody watching them. Um, and as we know, for a lot of our clients, they don't have that community support. You know, they don't have family or friends um, that can just step in and say, sure, I'll watch the kids. Um, so that's been a barrier. And then, you know, in terms of homeschooling, a lot of schools are still closed um, and virtual schooling is the new reality, um, sending your kids to school. Sometimes there might be a hybrid model where they go a couple of times a week, but it's not full time. And before care and after care are not, are not in session. Um, so we have to look at how, you know, how that's impacting our clients and how that's keeping them from achieving their goals. How can you work a full-time job? How can you get to financial security? Um, if that support in the community is not there. Um, We've seen the pandemic impact visitation. Um, and, you know, the ways that we've seen this is, is um, you know, if, if you've had to quarantine, if you've been diagnosed with COVID, if the kids or anybody in the house has been exposed or diagnosed with COVID, you know, visitation has been decreased. Um, and that's where, you know, we've tried to come in and say, well, we should be still be able to FaceTime. We should still be able to Zoom. You know, it shouldn't be a case where, all of a sudden the kids aren't having time with their parents um, for a prolonged period of time. And then, you know, what are the impacts of that? Um, impacts on mental health and, um, you know, well-being, depression, anxiety, we've seen a large increase in that area. And really just trying to um, be an advocate for our clients, be a voice for them and say, you know, if you're struggling in this area, what can I do to help? And I think that's a large part of where, you know, the parent advocates come in and they provide that emotional support that, um, that experience that they've been through, they kind of can um, build that rapport with the client. But if our client, if, you know, we do an assessment at the beginning of the uh, working relationship, you know, it's important to ask those questions I have a lot of clients who are in a deep state of depression and, you know, from their workers perspective, their DCPMP workers perspective, they're not putting in effort. 
And it's very easy to make that assumption, you know, from the outside. But I know, you know, that they're, they are dealing with their children being removed. They are dealing with um, loss of employment and feeling like worthless, worthless. And so it's, you know, our job to really pay attention to those, those factors and kind of say, what can we do to help? Are you seeing a counselor? Are you seeing a therapist? Are you on medication? Can I connect you to these resources? Is there a support group that you could take part in, um, in the community, even if it's once a week, once a month, um, just to feel like you are not alone. Um, that makes a big impact. Um, we've seen impacts in our children, you know, um, like I said uh, before, there's there's a large amount of our families that are in shelters. How is this impacting the kids? They're not having free playtime. They're not having open space. There's a lot of rules um, that they need to now abide by. Um, they're not they're being deprived of the ability to be children, um, and they were struggling with this before due to um, poverty, but now it's tenfold. Right. Um, and food insecurity, I think that's the last thing I um, want to touch on a little bit. So, yeah, food insecurity is a big one. And, you know, as much as we're, we've seen a lot of donations in, in light of the pandemic, um, we've seen a, a, um, a cut in hours for food pantries. So they're getting more donations, but they're not, now only open once a month. Um, even once a week is not often enough. If you have a client who's with their children, no food today, how are you able to provide community resources? How are you able to service them in a way where they could feed themselves, feed their kids, and not just for tonight, you know, until, you know, the next time they're able to get their food. Um, food stamps, we've seen a little bit of, you um, uh, peak in, in food stamp benefits. So, and especially with kids who are school aged or in the school system, they're giving a, lo uh, a little bit more of a um, benefit for them. Uh, and that's helped a little bit, but still getting to these places, transportation is a huge problem. And um, finding pantries that deliver has been a real struggle for us. And I'm sure you guys have dealt with that as well. Okay. Um, transportation. We have a lot of our clients that are spending a lot of money on transportation to and from work, um, using a lot of their funds for that. I have a client um, who's chronically homeless, spending almost $1,000 a month on a rental car because taking an Uber to and from all the time with four kids is not, not a viable option. Um, there's no public transport around her. Where welfare's placed her in a motel, she's in a rural area, she's off of a highway, she can't get to public transport. So um, we have to keep these things in mind. How, how are our parents able to, you know, um, care to their kids, purchase food, purchase other necessities, um, drop off to school, pick ups, go to work if you're able to, if you have the childcare and the means. Um, so that's been a, a big thing for us, kind of advocating to get grants for transportation, um, just to see if that's something that we can help facilitate and make a little bit easier for them. Um, the impacts, this has impacts on visitation, this has impacts on mandatory classes, um, although we've seen some classes be virtual, which has helped. Some mental health appointments are through telehealth, teletherapy, some are not. Um, and I would say the biggest thing that this has impacted for our clients is housing searches. So um, you have to go in person to put in applications for these apartments. And how are you able to do that if you can't get a car and get around? Um, and you're not just, the expectation is not just that you apply to one you know, um, apartment a week or um, a couple, it's just that you keep continuously submitting applications and you have to show this. There has to be proof that you're making an effort and that you're making strides. Um, and that's that's been a challenge. Um, 
I think I touched a little bit before on how COVID-19 diagnosis impacts visitation. Visitations may be lit limited, completely virtual. We saw a little bit of that at, at the beginning of the pandemic. Hopefully this has changed for, for your clients. I think for us, we've seen that it's improved. Um, and housing options have been severely limited. Limit inventory is very low. Um, there's an, a, a moratorium on evictions um, for us, and I think it's been extended into September. Um, and while it's helpful and beneficial for our clients who have not been able to pay rent, we have um, a, a large chunk of um, child welfare um, involved clients who are in transition, who might even have a voucher, who may have been approved for temporary rental assistance um, uh, through welfare, and they just cannot get an apartment um, because there are no apartments that are available because of the moratorium. So um, again, making sure that you're aware of all of these factors, educating yourself, and then trying to be a voice for your client with the division and say, they're doing their best, they're making strides and their efforts are there. It's just a matter of the system is not in place to support them. Next, okay. So I just want to touch on a little bit about how to support your client in light of the things that we just talked about, the impacts and um, the repercussions that, we, that they're dealing with. Um, so trying to be innovative, think outside the box, um, it's very important to kind of figure out different ways and avenues to get things done. We recently had um, a housing voucher program that was open and it was very limited. It was like 200 vouchers throughout the state. And it was a very short time period um, that applications needed to be submitted. And uh, of course the applications had to be submitted by mail. And um, so they had to be printed out you know, who has a printer, um, and they needed to be completed with a bunch of financial information and then also signed by our clients and then mailed to the organization. So this was a huge barrier, and I called the organization that was um, releasing the vouchers multiple times, and I got a lot of pushback at first, and then eventually by the third or fourth call, I was able to get to somebody who said, okay, if they're able to write a letter, even if it's just to email to you and sign it and say, I consent to the social worker to complete the application on my behalf, and then you can then mail that in with the application, we're willing to accept that, right? So you have to jump through a lot of hoops to kind of combat these barriers. Um, otherwise, they're not gonna be able to submit these applications um, and just really, you know, get creative. I feel like for from a social worker's perspective, um, completing a thorough assessment of your client, highly important, learning about who they are, what their history is, um, how their history has impacted their present, their future, um, because uh, we like to look at the client from a person and environment perspective, and that kind of gives us the bigger picture and helps us um, develop a comprehensive plan to work on goals and prioritize certain needs. Making yourself available to them, I think this has been um, really pivotal over the past couple of months, over, over the past year. Um, texting with your clients, emailing them, um, being available to them by phone, cell, you know, I've had a good amount of clients who can only call me after 5 p.m. because so they're working during the day. Um, so it's been important for me to kind of be flexible with my hours so that I can get through to them, speak to them. And then, you know, later the next day I can then, you know, communicate with their caseworker and kind of give updates on what their progress has been. Um, but just be flexible, make yourself available. Um, I think it's been important for us to not personalize inconsistencies and follow up and proactivity. You know, our clients are going through a lot. And if they're not getting back to you, they're not calling you at a certain time, or you gave them a certain resource and that they never made the phone call, they never made an appointment, try not to personalize that. That probably usually has nothing to do with you. Um, and it's important to really just keep going, um, be goal-oriented, solution-focused, 
and continue to support them and really meet them where they're at. You know, um, we have certain goals for our clients and they have certain goals for themselves. But at the end of the day, if they are going through something um, circumstantially that is um, keeping them in a place that they are and that takes priority over making an appointment over, um, you know, getting a certain script, whatever that may be. And that's what you have to respect those boundaries. Um, providing consistent support, weekly phone calls, emails, check-ins, even if it's just like shooting them a text, hey, how are you? You know, let them know that you're there for them. If it helps at the beginning of the working relationship, I would like to establish a time. I'm going to call you every Tuesday at this time. That way there's an expectation um, and you can maintain some sort of consistency. And like I said, really just commit to being solution focused if possible. Okay. Um, I think it's important for us as advocates to be educated on what's available. And I think in the um, arena of COVID, it's been um, a new, new resources available every, every couple of days. Um, you know, lotteries that are open, COVID rental assistance, food assistance. Um, I think at the beginning, we were getting emails left and right about, okay, we're having a food drive this week. And um, clients can come during this time to, you know, pick up food baskets or whatever the case may be. So um, establish those connections, um, maintain open communication, and really just be aware of what's out there because it's likely that you're going to have to tap into those resources to be, a, you know, be a support to your client. Um, doing research research on their behalf if they don't have access to the internet. I have a client recently, um, her only barrier to getting her kids back is getting a med medical marijuana card. Um, and she was diagnosed with anxiety and it was, she got the prescription and it had been months um, and she had made no progress. And after I had done the assessment with her, I kind of asked about that. She said, well, I don't have internet access. I can't do research online. Um, so how am I supposed to find a doctor? And, you know, looking into it myself, even from my perspective, it was a very confusing process. Um, and it was very challenging to kind of navigate. And so I could only imagine what she was going through without the proper access to um, the services that she needed to even get that information and get the ball rolling. So I, I did the research. You know, I called the doctor's offices on her behalf and just said, what's the process? Lay it out for me. And then I relayed that information back to her. And that helped her get to the next step. We were able to make an appointment. Now she's on her way. Um, and then I could report that back to our caseworker and say, this is what we've been able to accomplish. Housing searches, um, mental health, substance abuse professionals, um, parenting programs, classes. Again, have that conversation at the beginning of the relationship and just say, how can I be of assistance to you? What do you need help with right now? And how can I help? Um, and like I said, help facilitate that connection, making the calls. Um, attending appointments with them, attending family team meetings with them, providing financial support if possible. You know, we, we have some small grants that we're able to access if clients need food or transportation or even, a, you know, a stay in a hotel for a night, um, worst case scenario. So just kind of just being aware, aware of that. Okay. Um, facilitating dialogue between yourself, your client and the division. Again, being available for Zoom conference calls, family team meetings. If your client doesn't have a phone, offer to make the calls with them. Encourage them to reach out to their caseworker. I've had a lot of instances where I reach out to the caseworker, even with the client on the phone, and the caseworker says, well, we don't hear from the client. And I think, um, obviously, every caseworker is different. And so some of them will kind of just get um, hung up on that and say, well, we want to, they need to call us. You know, we don't want to be calling them. Um, and I, you know, I have my thoughts and feelings on that, but I try to focus on the positive with my clients and just say, you know what, we're going to do this. We're going to show them that we're making the effort. Um, and even if it's a text that you have to, you know, make or an email, just check in and say, Hey, this is what I've been up to. Um, Discuss with your clients in advance positive ways to present themselves virtually. And I think Bree is going to touch on that a little bit more in her part of the presentation. Um, but um, 
your backgrounds during Zoom, you know, um, just having, being in, a, in an area where you can speak without interruption, I know that might be difficult. Um, just looking at various ways to kind of keep it positive and make sure that, you know, um, you're making an effort the best way that you can. Ask to be included, make yourself available. Um, I've had to kind of just push myself into meetings sometimes and say, hey, I heard a family team meeting is taking place on this date and this time, can I attend? Um, and sometimes I get pushback, sometimes I don't. Sometimes they like to partner with you and say, sure, no problem, you know? Um, so really, again, just kind of learning who, who the caseworkers are and how you can kind of work, work around that. Um, asking questions to be goal oriented and providing insight on behalf of the client as to challenges while maintaining positivity. Um, so Mr. Smith or Ms. Smith has been doing housing searches, but they've been limited due, due to the ongoing moratorium. You know, just keep it simple and speak facts, obviously. This is the reality. Next. Okay. So just to wrap it up, um, be positive, be a voice for your client. Don't be afraid to speak up in defense and support of them and know that the advocacy that you're doing, even if it feels small, even if it feels different right now, um, it's huge for them and it makes a difference. Um, and you know, um, I encourage you guys to ask questions. Feel free to reach out to me. I'll leave my email in um, the chat box and I'm going to let Bree take over her section. Thank you. Amazing, Leah. I was feeling it. I was wanting to jump in and say something, but I didn't want to interrupt you. You really hit on some points. Um, Again, I'm Bree um, from Alameda County, Oakland, California. I'm going to talk about my experience um, coming into court first time in child protective service. When I talk about my testimony, my journey, sometimes I get emotional, sometimes my anxiety rises because this is my passion. This is what I like to do. This is how I want to get my point across. This is heard. So if I go there, bear with me, you guys. So my um, July 2008, uh, my son was born positive talks. Uh, fast forward, um, I had to, the worker told me I had to go to a meeting. At that meeting, I was told to go into our outpatient program. I knew I couldn't do an outpatient program. I went into a residential where the, at that time at the meeting, the worker said, yeah, right. When I disclosed, I was going into. Um, I hear about a court appointment. Me and dad go to the court. Have no clue about court. Didn't have a parent advocate. Sitting in those hallways intimidated by the agency staff walking up and down. You got the sheriffs. I'm on probation. So I'm sitting here, mind wondering, scared to death. Never had experience of child protection services in my family, heard about them, heard about all they do is they take your kids. That's all they want to do is adopt the kids. Um, I was appointed an attorney, Tony Mims. This attorney read me my report. This attorney knew me and dad were together engaged us both. This attorney stepped up for me. This attorney, um, the language where I can understand. Being in court, I had been the child attorney who said, you know what, we've heard your story before. I would 
I didn't get a chance to uh, voice my own opinion. I'm thinking that I was going to be able to defend myself. I'm not. I was alone. I was somebody before my addiction. Next slide, please. Changing the system inside out, using my lived experience. Because of everything I went through, I was able to go into program, fight to go to college, was able to go to college, was able to take up anything and every subject there was to learn about the social services department. I was able to join um, then a program that trained me to be a parent advocate, that gave me the tools. I was determined. I came into this, um, I came into the agency, I was 43. I didn't have another run. My um, my criminal judge told me I better not come in his courtroom. He asked me, why was I here? But you know what? If the AGC would have asked me, Bree, how can we help you? What is it you need to be successful? If they would have done that, it would have been a totally different outcome. But today, encouraging the parents, advocating for them, letting them know you, I did it, you can do it, you're not alone, give them that positive affirmation, let them know, hey, there's hope. There's always hope. It's so easy, it's so easy for someone to throw your past at you. Let that be held against you while you stand up here and you hear everything about your past. It happened to me, but I'm still a parent. I'm still human. If they would have known about all my trauma in my past as a child, me being molested, everything that went on with me, if they would have known about that, I could have gotten the help that I needed. The resources they have now, we didn't have it. What happened in our household stayed in our household. But again, Bree was determined. I had my son on my birthday. He's 12, he'll be 13 in July. I couldn't, the, the way I was treated, the way I had to then I say rent my son, see him on your terms. unheard of. Next, Alex. I worked with doing all the training and prepping me to become a parent advocate. I was hired on with a Berkeley, California, who was in conjunction with the agency. I was able to really advocate for parents, but I wasn't able to advocate at court. I found out about East Bay Family Defenders, an organization who defends parents at court. I couldn't believe it. It was unheard of when I said when I got the offer. And just imagine today, I'm fast forwarding, just imagine today during a pandemic, you're showing up to court. I know, <laughs> and I tell so many people this, I don't think I would have been able to reunify during a pandemic. I'm pushing extra hard for parents. They're throwing in the towel. They're, you know what? I can't do it. I need somebody to hold my hand. I, I don't have, my majority of my parents are substance abuse. 
And so they're needing to be in those rooms, those NA rooms. They need somebody to literally hold their hands. It doesn't always happen like that, you know? So many parents are, are saying, you know what, I can't, I can't do it. And so when they're throwing in the towel, I'm throwing it back saying, no, just like that. We got to keep going. We got to keep fighting. We got to show that, you know what? It's all about reunification. It's all about justice. We're dealing with racism, pandemic, showing up to virtual court, having that used against you. If they see the background, like Lisa touched on it, if they see the background in looking in, looking at your house, it's used against you. Just because that's how your household, it doesn't mean that's how mine is going to be. I got a roof over my head. Don't ding me for that. You know? It's hard. It's hard. I don't know. I don't know if the agency really understand what it's like. I know if I'm feeling it, being black, being a parent who's navigated, I can imagine how the parents are feeling. Um, I'm, because I'm not able to provide that support in the hallways like um, we did in person, I'm making sure that I'm able to be on the screen. I have so much, Layla talked about pushback. I have so much pushback just supporting my parents on the screen. If I'm here working with this parent, why can't I show up? Why can't I support them there? That's my job. I want them. It helps de-escalate the anxiety. You know, sometimes I just have to pop my face in just to let them know, okay, I saw her. I know she's on here. Well, I'm texting them during the court. Hey, I can come in this time. No, I can't come in, but I'm here. You know, sending them those positive affirmations. They need it. They need it because they're here alone. You can't bring your support system and you're on this screen with all see being judged. I love advocating. I love the work I do. I love connecting parents with all the resources. A lot of times before they need to be in a program before they get into court. So I'm on the phone calling, doing the three-way so we can make sure that I'm making that assessment and that intake happen beforehand. Because when you get inside that courtroom, you want to be signed up to family treatment court. You want to be engaged with your child welfare worker. So you know what? I'm Queen Bree. I'm the connector. I'm making sure, I, I'm making sure that all parties are connected. You know, and sometimes the, the, because of the experience that a uh, a parent has had with a child welfare worker and they don't want to call, they don't have a relationship with them, I always tell them, you know what, call after five. If you don't feel that you're able to talk and communicate properly or it'll be held against you, call after five. It's okay. Leave that message so that she won't say, well, mom didn't reach out, dad didn't reach out. First thing in the morning, they'll get that call from you. Um... I do a lot of prepping. I'm skipping. I do a lot of prepping for the parent for ver I let them know who's gonna be on, how to log on. Usually the um our attorney has already sent them the information. So it's just going over it, making sure that they have the right um Wi-Fi, they're not driving, um they're in a location where they're able to um it's their business but they're in a location where they're able to speak and everything. Um, we have some judges in our county who can be very intimidating. Some parents ask, hey, Bree, I don't want to be on the screen. Can I just hold the phone? I, and I explain to them, you can, but be careful because it'll be held against you. There's like, oh, you know what? We can't see mom. Well, you know, what's wrong with her? So um, it's just tri it's a trip. That virtual court, sometimes I think is um, is 
for me, it, it sets you up. If a parent doesn't have that voice, if a parent doesn't have a unique interdisciplinary team who can advocate for them, who has that attorney, that social worker, that parent advocate having their back, then you're set up. So it's so important to make sure that you're prepping before, you're debriefing, you're connecting them to, to the resources ahead of time and getting them engaged. You know, especially if you come in with a substance abuse problem, get those resources in, get them engaged to those programs. You know, I'm known for, and my office could vouch for this, for getting them to a program ahead of time. I have my own connections. I have my own back doors where I make sure they're in programs. So when they come, already, dad is already in that program. So they're a step ahead of the game. Yes, Alex. Um, I think I touched on this, but yeah, virtual court for me is having to ask permission before I was able just to go into court to ask people, is it okay if I can come in and support that parent, which can be very annoying, very annoying. Um, the feeling of having to start all over again, fighting for my voice at the table after I already paved the way to get to where I am today. Why do I have to do this all over again? It's re-traumatizing after me being who I am and paved the way and got to where I am on this level is dehumanizing. When, my, when I'm on court and then I'm cut off court without being noticed, it's like, come on now. I'm human. We can communicate. Um, again, access issues, um, having trouble and having not enough money, no Wi-Fi, all that can be held against you if you don't have the proper. Yes, Alex. So what's working? Coaching parents. Uh, doing texting and FaceTiming. I facilitate a support group, making sure they know the do's and adorns of virtual court or in the system. Um, I love giving parents the tools, educating them, passing on. That's how I get my blessings. When I see them engaging in, in saying, hey, I can, I can do this, that means a lot holding their hands. I couldn't wait to get vaccine and go out to the programs and meet parents in the community, meeting them where they are, making sure that, hey, giving them that affirmation, taking out of my money, taking gift baskets to them, giving them a goodie bag when they enroll. That means a lot. They say, I got somebody in my corner. You know, I hold my, um, Clothing, my son clothes, drop off to the programs for the ones who are less fortunate because it's a pandemic. It's hard. We don't have it. Money scarce. Um, I think, you know, I, I was eight years with the county. But being here at East Bay Family Defenders dependency firm is totally different. I'm, I'm finding out what pro-parent really means. I'm seeing how bringing a parent's voice to the tables is so crucial. Showing up in court is so crucial. Being there with an agency that represents them is huge. When they know we have their back, you know, you have any questions for me, please don't hesitate. I know I had to cut it short, but um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate. I am Bree. Remember that name. Thank you. Take it away, Alex. Thank you, Bree. All right. Um, yeah. And if you have any questions for either Bree or Layla, even while I'm speaking, throw them in the questions box um, and hopefully one of them will be able to respond to you. 
Um, I certainly do not mind. Um, I'm going to be talking about actually what it's been like in the courtroom. Um, and so uh, taking, you know, some things that Layla has touched on and Bree has touched on, especially in terms of preparing parents for that experience of doing trial in a virtual courtroom, um, whatever application the court is using, whether it's Zoom or something else. Um, and some best practices for what's worked and what's not worked and some things to think through as you that are unique to dependency court practice um, that you can take away. Um, but again, I think our presentation um, is one in which we hope that there could be dialogue. Um, so please share tips that you, um, whether you're a peer parent advocate um, or attorney or a social worker have um, have employed with your clients to make virtual court better. Um, so please share them in the, in the chat as I go along. I'm gonna be talking about sort of strategies for representing parents um, in virtual court hearings, uh, unique to dependency court, some pre-trial strategies uh, or pre-hearing strategies and what, what you need to think through or what we've been thinking through that's changed um, and what we've learned from this process. Um, and then also thinking about your hearings um, and how you do the thing that you do in court if you're an attorney um, that's different now that you're sitting in your basement like I am uh, presenting through a, a Zoom application. Um, so I'm going to go through things like direct examination, cross-examination, um, screen sharing and exhibits and then closing argument um, and things like that. Um, none of this is rocket science. Um, all of you um, are as um, are, are doing this in, in your jurisdictions and, and, and learning as you go. So please, again, share your, um, your expertise in the chat. Uh, one thing uh, that I like to do in all of my cases, and this was this was before um, the pandemic began, was to get as much discovery as I felt was necessary um, to understand exactly the way that um, the Child Protective Services Agency was going to present a case against my client, um, because I know what my client story is, because I've talked to my client and I've. Um, develop a rapport with them to understand exactly um, what is going on in their lives and and um, as best I can to understand it from the way they see it. Uh, but I also like to understand the way the Child Protective Services Agency sees it, particularly from an investigative standpoint. So um, I, I have a general idea about how they might view my client based on my view uh, and understanding of this the system, but I want to know what that caseworker did or did not do um, in investigating the hotline call that brought this case into into the court's jurisdiction, um, and who they talked to, who they didn't talk to. Um, I know there was something in the chat not going out to a house. Um, well, if you're going to come into court and testify about the state of a house, then I want to know that you actually went out there. Um, and we don't have the benefit of doing, you know, extensive pretrial discovery like depositions and things like that. Um, and we don't have, so we don't have the opportunity to do that. So a lot is in that case file or, or not in that case file, which I also find is relevant. So what I've been doing now is, is reaching out directly to um, our, the lawyers who represent the city of Philadelphia um, and, and getting those uh, files in electronic format. Um, and if they don't know how to do that, um, I don't stop asking. Um, it's in, my client is entitled to review that documentation. Um, and if they need to redact it to do it, then then so be it. Um, and of course, knowing that our you know picking and choosing your battles is a really important part of this discovery work because it's so informal, at least in Pennsylvania, um, it's very, very informal. In fact, it's required to be informal by court rule. Um, so, you know, it's not like I'm demanding every little document for, on every single one of my cases, um, but I, I think it's really important um, to get a better understanding of what's going on and what the case is against your client, um, in, 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 even in the COVID-19 era. Um, 
And um, in terms of exhibits, so this is this is really a practice point for me is that, um, you know, I used to go to court, I used to spend all day in court doing, you know, a handful of cases, and I'd be there all day, and I'd bring my files. Well, that's not what's happening anymore. Um, and so when I would go from courtroom A to courtroom B, I would have client's file, and I could pull out the exhibits and hand them to all the parties and the court. Uh, well, that's not happening anymore, obviously. Um, so, so I've changed my practice to uh, get as much information as possible in advance um, and, and use like PDF uh, formats to, to mark exhibits and send them to all the parties and the court or the court's clerk in advance um, so that when I'm in court, I can say to the judge, I just want to, I'm referring to exhibit A. In fact, I have a judge who the, the practice has become so routine that he, he like enters my exhibits because he's had, he's gotten them before I even get a chance to put on a witness to, you know, to authenticate those exhibits, um, especially in, in status hearings and review hearings. So there's a, a, a rhythm to it, um, but I, I think it can be really helpful. Um, but one thing you don't want to do is try to exhib introduce exhibits during the court hearing um, where you don't have an opportunity to present that exhibit to the other side, except through maybe emailing them while you're on a virtual court hearing. And that can really disrupt the flow of your case um, and, and, and inert to the detriment of your client in certain ways. Um, and this is, this is, I, I would echo everything Bree said about, about client prep for court. Um, I, you know, ensuring access to the courtroom is really important. Um, and also understanding, you know, if I'm going to be questioning you, um, make sure your video screen is on, but sometimes that's not possible. So we have to prepare for that scenario as well. Um, but it's the little things, uh, you know, understanding how to use the mute button, um, don't don't assume that people um, and your clients uh, have uh, used Zoom before um, and and know or they may be using it from their phone um, and they can't find the mute button on their phone. It's not as apparent as it is to me right here where I can see mute. Um, and I, I have trouble using Zoom on my phone. So I think even going through those little things can be really, really helpful, um, especially you know, our clients are sometimes at work. They're out in the community. Um, and some of that's not preventable. And sometimes that's just easier for them. And if there's a lot of background noise, it's important to, to be able to, to get those, situ those issues resolved. Um, and at those little tips, um, and I do that, we do that in, in consultation with, you know, our peer parent advocate too. Um, so it's about using the team approach as well. I, um, I, I, so in terms of witnesses um, and, and Zoom, I, I think there's a communication. It's a, it's an interesting form of, of communication. And I was thinking a lot um, about while Marty Guggenheim was discussing the, uh, or while he was presenting this afternoon, I was thinking about how, what I was seeing from him and what, how that works in a Zoom trial. And I think everything he was doing as a communicator um, is, applicable to our to our court hearings. Um, and I remember being at the the ABA conference two years ago, uh, or maybe it was three years ago, I guess, um, when when Professor Guggenheim presented. And I was all the way in the back at one of those tables and he was, you know, 200 yards away from me and I couldn't see his facial features. But today he was up close and personal and um, that really changed. It didn't change how, how I felt about what he was saying. Um, he gets me going every time. But um, it changed how I saw him and I could see how the, I could see the wrinkles in his face. And I think that you can see the wrinkles in the judge's face. You can see the wrinkles in your client's face and you can see people in a different way. Um, and I think it changes the way you present, um, in certain ways, or at least you should be mindful of it. And it also changes the way you might prep your client for court. Um, and uh, it can also be a really something to harness more than prep. It's something to harness, right? Because I think it um, it helps in terms of telling your client's story and your client empowering your client to tell their story um, to um, to be able to actually see people and look people directly in the eye um, and be up close and in, in, in personal. Um, and, you know, another thing that's missing from this, of course, is 
um, all of the daily interactions. Um, and I found that, you know, a client walks into the, you know, into the courtroom and the judge is already then making an, uh, you know, an assumption about your client or making a judgment about your client or making a judgment about you or the caseworker, whomever it may be. Um, and sometimes that can be good. Sometimes it can be really, really bad. And most of the time it is really bad. Um, and that's gone. Um, and so being mindful of that, uh, but also, um, you know, there's there's not as much time for sort of small talk, right? The judge can't do that. And so it's important for you to prep your client to tell their story in full um, because the judge isn't going to be able to, to have any of that sort of context other than, other than what's happening on the Zoom call. Um, and in terms of client prep, I, one of the, the, the things I, I've really noticed in doing Zoom trials is actually, I think, made me a better um questioner of my clients and a, a direct examiner um I, I find a lot of times uh, uh what i'm doing in court is cross-examination because it's you know the the, the child protective services is it, presenting their case first and and we're cross-examining them but um on zoom i've really um I, i've taken direct examination to a new level and i think in part that's because it's more like a judge reading a book and uh, then 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 watching a movie uh, because there's the judge is forced to use his or her imagination um, because nobody's there in the courtroom now of course you can see people on zoom and and you can see the backgrounds and that's an important thing to prep your client about but the 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 scope of of context is much more limited and I think it's challenged me to really prep my clients to consider um, or for me to consider how I want to present my clients um, my clients evidence and, uh, and and challenge me to, to work with my clients to tell their story uh, and be prepared emotionally and um, to tell their story and, and to empower them to tell their story um, and I do that in ways uh, when it's appropriate, um, and when my client, when when my client and I have a strong enough rapport that I feel like it, it, it's useful and safe, uh, but to really dig into their emotions um, about how this felt. Um, so rather, because this is all the judge is going to know about this case, um, and to dig into their emotions and think about how it felt when uh, the CPS worker came to your house. And I don't need to, to give the details of that because you all have done these cases or been through it yourself. So you know what it's like, uh, the horror that it's like. So I'm not gonna provide you that description, but my client, when I work with my client, um, if they're ready or prepared, we work on talking about what that was like um, because the judge needs to know the horror. But the judge also needs to know the joy and the beauty of what a client visitation looks like with their child. Um, and um, I take my clients through what that's like emotionally for them sometimes, if it's appropriate, um, because then they can they can latch onto that imagery, right? So I don't think you get to the imagery and the descriptions and the sensory language unless your client is prepared um, to, to, to go there with you. And I think, um, that's something I've learned during doing Zoom Zoom trial that I think um, has has been I hope to bring into my practice when we go back to to real court. Uh, but I think it's really critically important in dependency in, in child protection cases or, or family regulation cases, I should say. Um, and I think you know practicing with them to make them to help them understand how they are are being heard. Um, I have I had a one client who was an incredible client. I mean, all my clients are incredible, but she was incredible. Um, and I knew she was incredible. I worked for her for so long and our peer parent advocate, you know, we, this is all during the pandemic. She was going out to her home, um, putting things on her doorstep, you know, that she wasn't able to get staying six feet away, doing all that little stuff to make her know that we were here for her. And so we had a relationship with her. Uh, and when I went to prep her for her ultimate hearing, it went so badly, which was my fault, of course, um, because I knew she had it in her. But then we got down deep into um, into those emotions and into and, and orienting her into what that was like. So it wasn't like, um, you know, what did you do on your visit? We played games. It was you're at your visit. What's happening? 
right? Oh, well, you know, my daughter's running up to me and giving me a hug. And she, I heard her say my name before she even got to the room I was going into. And then I could hear her running down this, down the hallway and, and coming into the visitation room for the first time in months and, and running up and giving me a hug. Right. And the first time we prepped, it was, you know, we played games and it was fun and it was nice. Um, but when we got down into that and with questions like you're at your visit, right, you're there. Tell me what it's like. Tell the judge what it's like. And then then tell me what it's like. And then we'll get to. All right. Tell the judge what it's like. Um, can you please tell the court what it's like? Because that 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 question doesn't make any sense to anybody unless you've really prepped them um, in order to be successful on direct examination. Um, you know, this is some of the stuff that Bree touched on as well. Um, I, I would say, you know, I, all this stuff is really important. At the same time, I kind of mentioned this. I've had, I've had cases, really successful cases, where my client joins the courtroom while she's driving or he's driving, um, and you know, it's not ideal, but, um, but in some ways, maybe that client wasn't going to make it to court in 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 a pre-pandemic non-virtual court setting, and so. Um, I think that that makes the witness prep even more, right? Because if your if your client's prepped or your witness is prepped, it doesn't matter where they are; they're going to tell their story um, like it was and like they felt it in that moment. Um, another thing I would I would mention um, is I learned pretty quickly, and I I feel like most people have um, that uh, sharing screen sharing can actually be a really great tool um, in ways that uh, actually even just regular um, in person exhibits you know, uh, hard copy exhibits were not. I've done a few hearings where, you know, I've put it, the exhibit right on the screen and it actually takes away, you know, it, it, the, the problem with that is it, you know, it may take your client away um, from the screen or you from the screen. And if it's really important, if you think it's really important for the judge and the other parties to be able to see your client while testifying or see your witness while testifying, um, that, that there's a risk to it. Um, but I do think using screen sharing can be really important because the judge is only looking at the screen, not anything else in the room. And when you put an exhibit on the screen that talks about how successful and how uh, your client was in, in a particular program and how, how great of a parent your client is and it's there on the screen, it can be really, really helpful um, and really powerful. Uh, so I would, I would, um, I would recommend using that when when it's appropriate. The the one thing in our in our courthouse is we have to kind of let the other parties know we intend to do that, um, which is a new thing. And of course, and also let the judge's clerk know that we intend to do it because the screen sharing function is usually locked. So I don't do it in every hearing, but if I'm planning to do it, I will I will request that function. Um, I would say cross cross examination. Um, it's different in that um, now I'm able to look directly at the witness um, and I can see everything that the witness is doing um, and the way they're looking, where they're looking. And I can still also be looking at the judge simultaneously. And I think it's a really interesting, it, I would say the one thing for me, it's challenged me to do is, is get away from the documents and connect with the witness in a way that um, I, had, I hadn't really, you know, you, you don't get that closeness, even even from a witness sitting in the witness box um, in, in court um, and even approaching a witness. Uh, so I, I think it's really important to um, to actually harness the communication that's happening on Zoom. That's much more intimate in certain ways, even where I know there's been a lot of comments about how disorienting and how a distance it feels to be on Zoom for meetings or, or hearings, in many ways, I can look directly at somebody um, and I can read them in a way that allows me to, to not just hear what they're saying, but, but understand their social cues and to use that to ask my next cross-examination question of them rather than being so tied to my notes or the documents I'm maybe cross-examining them with. I would also say, I have had some appeals in very contested cases um, where the court reporter is also on the Zoom hearing and um, there's been lots of talk over each other or you know, using complex you know, therapeutic terms or medical terms have not come across well in the transcript. So there is a very practical issue with this um, that you need to be mindful of. Um, same thing with, so, so in terms of using exhibits on cross-examination, one thing I liked to do um, and this is different for everybody, 
it while during in-person court um, was to approach a witness with an exhibit. Um, so if I got something in the C in the CPS file that showed that um, they, my client had done what they were saying my client hadn't done or that the, the investigator had failed to, to look into something, you know, say the investigator was alleging my client wasn't taking her child to developmental, you know, physical therapy appointments or occupational therapy appointments, but I had documents proving that she did. Um, and I would approach the witness with that kind of exhibit. Um, or if there are prior inconsistent statements um, that were made, uh, you know, approaching the witness with those things. You can't do that. And that's, I, I, it took me a very long time to come to terms with that on Zoom hearings. And I was requesting a lot of in-person hearings at the beginning of the pandemic, which nobody liked. Um, it didn't make me any friends, um, but I felt it was necessary to do for my client. I'm doing it less and less now because I'm more comfortable with trial by Zoom. Uh, and I, what I will do now is send my exhibits to the opposing party and the witness. Don't expect the lawyer for the witness to even share the, the exhibit with the witness um, to make sure that they have a copy of it. And then I ask them to pull it up on their computer, right? So if it's a, if it's a clinician, I ask her to him or her to pull it up on, on the, um, on, on her computer, for example, and to go through it. I've done that with prior testimony and I say, okay, well, isn't it true on, on this date you testified this way and now you're saying something different today. Um, and uh, the trick there, I think really is just to make sure that you don't run into objections because you haven't prepared um, or you haven't shared the, the exhibit with the witness ahead of time. Um, the, the one other big tip, um, and this goes back to the screen sharing piece, is that if you are dealing with a, a fairly complex case, maybe involving medical records or therapeutic records, um, it may be useful to create a, a demonstrative exhibit you wish to use for cross, um, where you might, you know, if you have 300 pages of medical records, but you want to highlight five of them, and really even like three things in those, create a PowerPoint if you have the tools available using call outs and highlights and things like that. Um, and then ask to, to share the screen because you have a right to question a doctor about the medical records that she's relying on. Um, you have a right to question a clinician the same way. So, um, and again, make sure you provide that ahead of time so that the opposing counsel can review it um, to make, because you are creating something new, um, but it should be allowable to the extent um, that everything you're, is in, that's in your demonstrative PowerPoint or your cross PowerPoint is, is something that's in evidence um, or that you're intending to put into evidence. Um, and that, that's, that's basically it. Um, I, in terms of summation, I think uh, my points here are really the kind of points I was, I was making about Marty's presentation. I have actually found that it really focuses me. I can see myself too, which is, is, is an interesting thing. Um, and I have really honed in on trying to make that, that elevator pitch um, that really channels what I've learned from my client in, in prepping my client. Um, and so there's nothing really earth shattering about that. Um, and then, you know, just request, and, and I say all that um, to say, if you feel like due process requires um, an in-person hearing, and some of you have mentioned that your court's already doing contested hearings in person, uh, sort of by court rule, um, that's great. Uh, make sure if you feel like it's necessary for your client that you make that request um, and, and file a motion if it's necessary. A couple of attorneys in our courthouse have done that um, to be and, and have had and it's been successful. Um, and and there are problems with transcripts when you do trial contestant hearings on Zoom. So make sure you, you're thinking that through. Um, and yeah, I think we're almost done. I don't know if there's any specific questions um, at this point that anyone hasn't responded to but feel free right we're done at four right yeah okay um i've been monitoring the questions i think we've answered them there was one um about getting funding for a parent advocate um so i'm not sure i think every agency might be different um i think for us we applied for a grant um mm -hmm. Bree, can you give some insight do you know what, um what county are you in are they in um, and that's what we did we had to uh 
that's what my directors did. They had to put in proposals for different uh, size funders to support our interdisciplinary uh, program for parents. Mm -hmm. So we're able to have two so far, and um, we're trying to do more, but for just two. Yeah, we have two too. I think they said that they were in New Hampshire. Any advice on demanding Zoom over purely telephonic for contested hearings? I think it depends on on your case um, and uh, the evidence that you have or you intend that, that you expect to come in um, and, uh, and and the judge and, and all of those circumstances. I, I, you know, I think it's really necessary to be able to see people. I would never do a hearing in which I knew my client was not going to be able to to be to be seen. Um, so I think that's really important, too anything telephonically. I think that's that's <laughs> completely inappropriate. Um, but uh, the question is really about Zoom versus in person um, and, and why that's necessary uh, is going to be a case by case decision, I think. Um, in terms of the peer parent funding, we have a peer parent advocate. Uh, but I do think there's Title IV E funding available. So if you work um, in a for parent defense that uh, I, that's not my area of expertise, but I would consider looking into Title IV E funding um, because it's necessary uh, to have an interdisciplinary team that includes uh, someone like Bree um, who has um, the expertise more so than anyone else at being a survivor of this, this horrible system. It is so unique being on the interdisciplinary. You know, when I first heard about it from New York and um, San Jose, I couldn't believe it. You know, all parties on the same team advocating for the same parent is unheard of, right? So it, when you, a parent sees that we have the key players, these are our team members, that gives them more motivation. When they see that we all are there for them, that gives them the motivation to thrive even harder. And that's what parents need, you know, especially during these times, especially during these times to see that, yeah, we got your back. We're here for you. We're going to ride with you. And it's even more awesome if we can bring a child welfare worker aboard with us as well. But um, There's a question about, um, I do realize we're, we're probably out of time, so people may be leaving the room. Um, there's a question from Catherine about cooperation from the jails. I, I, I don't know if, if Layla or Bree have had this experience, but I have not had a client who has been incarcerated and who has had a contested hearing in which I felt their presence was, I have actually haven't had any, um, incarcerated clients who needed, who, who actually had been unable to attend a virtual court hearing. Um, but I would be, I would be yeah, they need to be present. Um, and so I'd file whatever was necessary to make sure that they were brought down. Um, if they can be in person incarcerated, they can be brought into the courtroom. Yeah, I haven't personally. I think somebody asked, is Zoom here to stay national, uh, nationally? Um, I think so. Um, I think, you know, we're preparing to go back to the office in the fall and we have a specific area in our office at Legal Services that's going to be just for clients. Um, to appear by Zoom. So I think I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is gonna be a court, you know, a jurisdiction by jurisdiction decision. Like we don't right. have anywhere for, for anybody to do, parents to do a virtual hearing in the courthouse or attorneys to do that. Um, so it, it's, it's challenging. Um, I would also say, you know, it, as something Marcella mentions, that it, appearing virtually makes counsel prepare more thoroughly. I think that's true. Um, I, it certainly is. Um, I've changed the way I prepared, um, but I do think <laughs> that um, our clients often are um, and do not, well, I guess the other side often does not prepare exhibits and pro provide them in advance, but they can't get away with that anymore um, because if they don't do it, then they can't admit them in a Zoom trial. So they have to provide them in advance. So we actually are getting some discovery that we were unable to get before, um, which is which is a helpful thing, um, just proves the point uh, we've been making all along, but yeah. Awesome. I think that's it. Thank you all so much. 
Yes, um, indeed. Yes, and I indeed. think we dropped our emails in there. If you guys caught it, you know, shoot us an email anytime. Thank you all. Thanks for showing up. Yeah. Any more questions? Don't hesitate. Oh. In the chat, you guys. And in